Second Peter, chapter one. Uh, before we go any further, though, let's pause and ask God's blessing on our thoughts this morning. Lord, we do indeed give you thanks for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his love for us, for his great sacrifice on our behalf. It's because of him that we are gathered here today. And we thank you for your word and for the many promises that we can find in its pages. Or promises that remind us of your faithfulness to us in every circumstance we face in life. We praise you for it. Lord, we pray that as we look into you this morning, that we're mindful of your Holy Spirit, of his voice speaking to our hearts. Lord, that we be listening with that desire to be more like you in all that we do and say. For we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture before us today contains a key passage on the doctrine of the inspiration. That's the doctrine that teaches us that the Bible is God's holy word. Look at verse 19 and following. Here Peter says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arises Knowing this first, above all else, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, the holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. These verses assert several important truths for us. Firstly, that what we have here written down in the 66 books of the Bible is not a work of literature reflecting the opinions of this author or that. No, it clearly says that no part of Scripture is of any private interpretation, of any personal interpretation. No part of the Bible is a result of an author's imagination or creativity. The Bible is not the result of one person's conception of God. In fact, at least 40 different individuals, if not more, contributed to the writing of the Bible over a period of one and a half thousand years. That's important, because it means that the Bible is not the product of one man who lived at one moment in time in one single culture. In a sense, it's true to say that the Bible is the accumulation of wisdom that's the product of many individuals gathered together over a very long period of time from a variety of cultural backgrounds and experiences. But these verses go on to say more. They go on to say that everything written down and preserved in what we call the Holy Bible today was a result of divine inspiration. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. Moved, they were literally carried along, they were inspired, they were guided by the Holy Spirit. As the authors of the Bible sat down to write out, uh, the Holy Spirit was there, guiding them as they wrote, ensuring that what was written down was exactly what God wanted us to know. The Lord kept them from writing anything that he did not want us to know, or that was false or untrue. How well do we appreciate today just what we have in this book that we call the Holy Bible? It's like no other book in the world. It's not just another literary anthology containing works of history or law or biography or poetry or prophecy. It's all of that and more. But it's also the divinely inspired Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says much the same thing. For every scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable to us for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Down through the centuries, men and women have been willing to face persecution, torture, even martyrdom for the sake of this book. It wasn't so long ago that a large portion of humanity lived under communist dictatorships where the Bible was a forbidden book. Why is it always the Bible? Have you noticed that? It's always the Bible that gets forbidden. There are stories of Christians living in communist countries that shared individual pages of the Bible in secret, guarding over them with their lives, sharing them when one group 
house group to another. Stories of individuals who risk life and limb to smuggle Bibles in, uh, across the Iron Curtain. They didn't do it for money, they didn't do it for personal gain, but simply because they had a heart for God and His Word. And today, we hear stories of men and women living in Muslim countries, where Christians live in fear of retribution from others. Stories of people who sit down in the privacy of their home, writing out the Bible word for word as it's read out over the radio stations, the pirate radio stations. Such is their hunger to read and to know the Word of God for themselves. So what is it about the Bible that inspires such loyalty and commitment? In today's scientific world, isn't it past its uh, use-by date? Are those stories just uh, the misguided fanaticism of some desperate people that lived far back in ancient times and didn't know any better? Or is the Bible a book for today just as much as when its words were first written down? Why should we still give our attention to the Bible and what it has to say to us? So many people in our world today have a low opinion of the Bible. To the point even of scorning it or scorning those who profess to believe in it. But in fact, the Bible, still the greatest book that mankind has in its possession. It's the most powerful book known in the history of the world. So powerful that every would-be dictator and tyrant lives in fear of it and fear of the people who live by it. In our text today, we have the testimony of just one of the many writers whom God used to pen, put his, his word to paper. And his name is Peter, the Apostle Peter, one of the twelve disciples of Jesus. When Peter wrote this letter to the church, he was no longer a young man. He was looking back over the experiences of his lifetime, first as a, a disciple of Jesus many years before, and, and then uh, following on from that as an apostle of the New Testament church. He knew his time left on earth was limited. He was getting older. And so he writes this second letter to strengthen believers in their faith and to warn them against those who would seek to pervert the truth of the Christian faith. I've often stated that when you study a passage in the Bible, you should look for things that are repeated, repeated phrases or repeated words. Well, in our text today, there's a word repeated three times. It's the word remembrance. First, we find it first in verse 12. Wherefore, Peter says, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. And then he says in verse 13, Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, speaking of his body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. And then verse 15, Moreover, I will endeavour that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. So why the emphasis on remembering? Well, we get something of a clue in these verses as well. Look back to verse 13. There's a reason why Peter is concerned that they don't that they remember these things and not forget them. Because he says, I'm not going to be around for much longer. Yea, I think it neat as long as I am in this tabernacle to put you to stir you up. By putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. He says, I think it meet, I think it's fitting, I think it's proper, as long as I'm in this tabernacle. That's an unusual phrase, we don't kind of think of ourselves that way much anymore. But by tabernacle or tent, he's referring to his body, his flesh. It's just a tent. The real him is on the inside. He knows his body will not last forever, but that doesn't matter to him, because he knows that his body is not the real, he, the real person. The real Peter is his soul, that part of him inside his body that is his will, his conscience, his mind, his thoughts and memories, his emotions, his personality. That's the part of him that will live forever. And Peter here is very much thinking about the time of his death, that it's approaching. He says, knowing shortly, I must put off 
this Magadi. And like anyone getting on in their years, he spends a lot more of his time reminiscing, looking back, maybe remembering the days gone by, reflecting on the many experiences of his life. What about kinds of things might have filled Peter's mind? Perhaps he remembered that first time he was introduced to Jesus, when his brother Andrew came running up to him with his amazing words, we found the Messiah, John chapter 1 verse 41, and how Jesus had met him and given him a new name up to that point, his name was Simon, but it was Jesus that gave him the name Peter. Or there may be the time that Jesus was preaching to the multitudes on the shores of Galilee. While they were there mending their nets after a long night's fishing. And how Jesus had asked if he could use their boat. That he might preach to the crowds so that everybody could hear him. And they wouldn't, nobody was in danger of getting pushed around. Or how he shoved off a little ways from the shore and dropped anchor. And then listened as Jesus began to preach about the kingdom of God. And then once the preaching was over, how the Lord encouraged them to drop their necks down over the right side of the boat to gather in a great catch of fish. Or how about the time when they were there with Jesus, when some friends lowered a paraplegic man down through the roof, and Jesus healed them? Or the time that Jesus took him and James and John into the room of a little girl who had just died, and how incredible as it was, he brought her back to life again. Or the time that, Lazarus, that, that Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead, even though he'd already been buried and in the tomb for, for four days. As Peter looked back over the years, how he must have been blessed to recall so many wonderful, extraordinary things he'd been privileged to see. None of the things that Jesus taught. How Peter's whole understanding of life and reality had been turned upside down. How he'd been completely transformed as a person from the inside out through the things that Jesus taught. There were other memories. Memories which may have brought him some pain or sadness. Like the time when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter remembered uh, maybe with a bit of uh, uh, embarrassment or, or shame how he'd been so impetuous on the occasion. Remember he came out swinging a sword, didn't know what he was doing and he chopped off the, the, uh, the ear of, of some poor servant standing nearby and how Jesus so graciously reached out and healed the man and told Peter to put up his sword. For all they that take up the sword shall perish by the sword. And then how he and the other disciples had run away in fear leaving Jesus behind. How late that evening he had denied ever knowing the Lord Jesus. Not just once, but three times. How everything that Jesus had said about him had come true. How could he have said such a thing about the one who had only ever treated him with grace and compassion and understanding? How Peter had wept those bitter tears. And then there was the cross. That awful moment when he saw the Lord hanging on the cross against the dark and lowering sky. And John standing there with Mary and some of the other women huddled and weeping in sorrow. And then it was Christ's death, the earthquake, the rocks tumbling, the people crying out for fear, and the emptiness that came over him, that great gaping hole of anxiety he felt deep within himself at the loss of the Saviour. Had all his hopes and dreams for the future come to nothing, dashed in a moment? But then, there was Christ's resurrection. The wonder of the empty tomb. The joy of seeing the risen Lord. Of Christ's ascension back to his heavenly kingdom. The coming of the Holy Spirit and power. The sermon that he preached on that day. And, and seeing the New Testament church come to shape. And all that had happened since. I wonder if in his later years. Peter ever harbored any regrets. What do you think? I don't think so. And then there's the prophecy that Jesus gave to Peter about what happened to him in his later years. You can read about it in John chapter 21. There Jesus told Peter, look, when you were young, you dressed yourself and you walked wherever you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch forth your hands and another shall lead you 
where you do not wish to go. And we're told, John tells us, this Jesus spoke to him, signifying what kind of death he should glorify God. And according to church tradition, Peter was taken, he was arrested, he was imprisoned, and he was crucified. Peter says nothing about any of this in his letters, but it seems that Peter knew his time was limited. Because he says in verse 15, Moreover, he says, I endeavor that you might be able, after my death, after my decease, after I'm gone, that you will have these things always in your remembrance, that you won't forget the message of the gospel. Whatever his circumstances were when he wrote this letter, what was his mood? Do we find an old man beaten down by life and defeated in the face of death? There's another word repeated in our text. It's the word sure. Look at verse 10. He says, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your election, your calling and election, sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. And then he says in verse 19, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereof you do well to take heed. That word sure literally means to be firm, to be steadfast, secure. It expresses the idea of being constant, immovable, unwavering. We come across this word in a couple of other places in the New Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 19, there's this promise. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having the seal. The Lord knows those who are His. The truth that the Lord knows those who, those who belong to Him by faith. It's a foundation that stands sure. It's firm. It's steadfast. It's secure. It's unmovable. It's unwavering. It's a foundation that cannot be moved. It's the foundation on which to build your life. I wonder this morning... Before we go any further, is there anyone here that's unsure of what foundation your life is built on? Are you resting on that foundation? When you find yourself someday standing before God on His throne, high and lifted up, and He looks deep into your heart, will He recognize you as one of His own children? Will He see a heart that believes and know that you are His? And then the same word shows up again in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19. It says, Our hope is in Jesus Christ, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. When you have Jesus, you have the one thing you need more than anything else. When Jesus is your hope, then you have a hope that is both sure and steadfast. A hope that will not give way, a hope that will not disappoint. When the day comes and heaven and earth shall tremble and pass away, your hope in Jesus Christ stands sure, it stands secure, because Jesus will remain. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the one in whom all our hopes are found. And here, Back in our text this morning, Peter, he sounds anything but defeatist. In fact, just the opposite. He seems and sounds more convinced than ever of the truth. And he wants to reassure the believers who share the same faith. Look, what you've got stands sure. Give diligence. Make every effort. Put your time and effort to making sure that you are saved, that you belong to Jesus. That's what he says in verse 10. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. It's too important a matter to put off to another day. This is why he says in verse 12, I've gone on such great lengths in this letter to put you always in remembrance of these things. My heart's desire is to see you established in the truth, no longer struggling with doubts and insecurities and Fears. Someone may ask, is that kind of faith really possible? Is it possible to be sure about anything in life? Years ago, I will not say how many, when I was a student attending the University of Alabama, I took a course on early British literature. 
And during one session, we were studying a work called The Dream of the Rood. I usually have to explain that word to a lot of people, but you Scots know what a rood is. It's an old-fashioned word for the cross. It was the dream of the cross. One of the oldest works in all of English literature. <coughs> it's a poem about a dream that the author had of the cross of Christ. As my professor began explaining the meaning of the poem, she also explained in the course of the lecture the meaning of the cross, and she did a great job of it. In fact, she told the story of the cross with such clarity and with such passion that one of the students raised her hand in class and asked her if she believed it. This was her answer. I wish I could. Now, I know I've told that story before, but it left an impression on me. I'd always heard stories of people who said things like that when they were faced with the truth, but I'd never heard it for myself until then. Sadly, I've heard it repeated many times by different people over the years. People are willing to put their faith in all sorts of things, to trust in all sorts of things in this world that will disappoint them, that will fail them. But they struggle to trust in the one thing that has never failed. Shortly after I moved back to Eyemouth to take up my post here as pastor, uh, we met an elderly lady who knew my parents. She'd been a teacher in the high school, uh, but was now retired. But to make a long story short, she started coming to the services here, over in the other building. One day she told me why she started attending the services. She and her husband were next door neighbours to us years before, and I grew up as a child. Her husband grew, amongst other things, prized chrysanthemums in his uh, house. When my mum and dad returned to Imouth in 1968, after visiting in the States, uh, the town noticed that my parents were missing a child. My younger brother, Kenneth, had died in a tragic drowning accident, which was just 18 months old. The lady told me that shortly after their return, she went over to my parents' house with a gift of some of her husband's prized chrysanthemums. She asked them how they could keep going after enduring such a tragedy. And my parents told her it was because they knew their little boy was safe in heaven with the Heavenly Father. She said, at that time, I couldn't understand such faith. And then she turned to me. Years later, she says, when I heard you were back and preaching at the Baptist church, I had to know more. I want to have the same faith. Peter himself had been through some extraordinary circumstances, and yet even now, as he was facing the end of his life, his faith remained unshaken. He knew what he believed. In fact, if anything, it was stronger than ever. What was the source of Peter's conviction? Look at verse 16. He says, we've not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He knew what he believed because he was there. He'd seen it with his own eyes. And he goes on to share one memory in particular which stood out to him above all others, an incident which he never forgot for the rest of his life. Look at verse 17. For he received from God the Father honour and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. Do you know what he's talking about here? Peter's talking about the, the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was transfigured before their eyes, when for one brief, shiny moment, the true glory of Jesus as the Son of God shone out in all its dazzling brilliance. So much so that Peter and the other disciples that were with him, they had to cover their eyes from the blinding light. And as they did so, they heard a voice, the voice of God speaking from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Apostle John in his letter, corroborates Peter's testimony. He says in the opening verses of 1 John chapter 1, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, which we've touched with our hands, the life, this life was made manifest, and we've seen it, 
And we bear witness and proclaim to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, has appeared to us. But, says Peter, you don't just have to take my word for it. Because, he says in verse 19, you have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well to take heed. You have a witness even more certain, even more sure and steadfast, even more tried and tested and proven than my own eyewitness testimony. You've got the testimony before you of the written word of God. Verse 20, knowing this, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came, not in old time, by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Peter saying, all those prophecies from ancient time, all the prophecies that were written down in the Old Testament, they all give testimony to the reality that Jesus is the Christ, the promised one, come from God. What is the testimony of the Bible itself? Psalm 68 verse 11, the Lord gave the word and great was the company of those who published it. Think of all those who wrote the Old Testament scriptures, just Moses. There's Samuel, David, and the Psalms. There was Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, and many of the other prophets. All of them foretold, in one way or another, the coming of the Christ. Psalm 40, middle of the Psalms, uh, uh, verses 8, 7, and 8. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O Lord. Yea, thy law is written within my heart. Psalm 119, verse 89 reminds us that forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It's unchanging. And when Jesus came, he too spoke of the unchanging, unalterable, eternal truths of God's word. He said in Matthew chapter 5, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law. I'm not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth shall pass away, not one dot, not the least stroke of a pen on a page of Holy Scripture shall in any wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Matthew chapter 24 verse 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. No, not even in the last days, when the heavens and the earth as we know it shall cease to exist, not even then shall the word of God fail. It shall abide forever, even as God himself abides ever. And as the word of God remains, so do all the promises of God's word. They remain till all shall be fulfilled. In Numbers 23 and verse 19 we read that God is not a man. He's not like us that he should lie nor the Son of Man, that he should repent or change his mind. That's why Titus, in his letter, can speak of the hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. So you might ask, as we consider the Word of God and its unchangeable reliability, its faithfulness, how can I know that God will keep his promises to me? What proof is there that God keeps his promises? Well, I could point you to how Christ himself fulfilled the prophecies. I could point you to other prophecies in the scripture that have been fulfilled. I could point you to the universal experience of God's people down through the ages. In every age, in every culture, those who sought after God with all their heart have found God's promises to be true. They may have been tested, they may have been tried, they may have been put through severe circumstances, but through it all they discovered for themselves that God's word never failed them. But I'm going to turn to just one passage in Scripture this morning to make my point. I want you to turn all the way back to Genesis chapter 8 for just a sec. Keep your thumb there in 1 Peter if you want. There's Genesis chapter 8, first book in the Bible, the last verses of the chapter, chapter 8, verse 20, we're told that Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the sweet savour, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth, Sea time and harvest, cold and heat, 
summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. What had happened? If you look back at Gen Genesis chapter 6, we are told earlier that things on earth had gotten really bad. So bad, in fact, that God had determined to destroy everything and start all over again. Look what he says in Genesis 6 verse 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him and his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing in the fowls of the earth, for it repented me that I have made him. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That was the pronouncement. But it was another 120 years went by before the floods, waters came. God delayed his judgment mercifully in order to give people time to repent of the ways. But the day came when time was up. The window of mercy was over and the destruction came. Look at chapter 7, verses 11 and following. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventh day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Jacob and the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with him into the ark where they were saved. It's popular today to debunk the story of the flood. But then you're going to have to explain to me why every ancient cultural tradition around the world contains a story about flood. From the ancient peoples of the Middle East, to the ancient Chinese, the ancient Japanese, the native peoples of North America, the ancient civilizations of Middle and South America, all across Africa, and indeed the aboriginal traditions of Australia and the South Pacific, they all have a story of the flood. You're going to have to explain to me how some of the many different geological features and fossil beds that we find all around the world for which scientists still don't have a satisfactory explanation. Something happened. The Bible tells us there was a great flood. But God ensured that life would survive. From among humanity there was Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives. And now that the flood waters have receded, it was safe for Noah and his family to leave the confines of the ark behind. God made them a promise. Look what he said in uh, chapter 8 and verse 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. There's a lot of talk today about climate change, a lot of doom and gloom. Now, we should do what we can to protect our environment, this wonderful planet, this wonderful gift that God has given us. But this is an amazing promise. While the earth remains, as God sits on his throne, as long as the earth here, as we know it remains, the annual cycle of seasons shall continue. Indeed, each day and each night are a constant memory to us, a reminder to us of the faithfulness of God. Kings and kingdoms, nations and empires will come and they will go, but through it all, nature endures. A constant testimony to the faithfulness of God. When something ha happens, even still today, people will say, well, cheer up. Tomorrow's another day. The sun will come up again. Yes, exactly. And that should remind you that God is still on his throne. I love the words in one of the hymns that we sing. We'll sing it in a minute. Great is thy faithful. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest. Sun, moon and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature and manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy and love. It's exactly what I talked about in this passage. Do you doubt the promises of God? Then ask yourself this. Does the sun still shine? Just what are God's promises to us? The greatest promise in all of God's word is the promise of his salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's not repeated just once, but three times throughout the scriptures. Joel 2, 20, 32, Acts 2, 21, and Romans 10, 13. And there are many more promises, many more. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. If anyone uh, confess openly with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believes in the heart that God has raised from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. It is by confessing the Lord Jesus that you are saved. I could go on. Many more promises of salvation freely offered in the scriptures. And they're there for the taking. The question is this. Have you taken up God on his word? Have you claimed the promise of salvation for yourself? Can you remember a time in your life when you prayed to God, confessed your sins and asked him to come into your life to be your saviour and Lord? This is the promise that opens up the door to all the other of God's promises. The promise of his presence, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. The promises of his protection, when you go through the rivers, I will be with you. And through the floods, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Yea, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There's a promise of his help. Fear not, for I am with you. Neither be thou this day, for I am thy God. I will help you. I will strengthen you. I will hold you with the right hand of my righteousness. If God be for us, who can be against us? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. There are the promises of his provision. Don't fret, don't worry yourself over what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear because your Heavenly Father knows you need these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. My God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And then there are the many promises of His blessing. Taking heed to the word of God and being sure to observe uh, all that is written therein for then you will have good success. Then you will know what true prosperity is. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. Prove me now, says the Lord here. here with. Bring your tithes into the storehouse and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing which there shall not be room enough to contain. He is the vine, we are the branches. He that abideth in me shall bring forth much fruit for without me you can do nothing. The promise of his mercy is the Lord's tender mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. In her lifetime, Fanny Crosby wrote thousands of hymns, several of which we still sing today. But she suffered all her life from a disability. Just a few weeks after she was born, she was struck down with an illness that left her completely blind. She never regained her eyesight. Some people might look at her circumstances and be tempted to complain. Oh, if there's a God, why would we let something like that happen? But not Fanny Crosby. She grew up to love the Lord and learned to see that even in her blindness, this was a blessing from God. But don't take my word for it. Let her own words speak for themselves. In one of her hymns, she wrote the following line. Can I doubt his tender mercy who through life has been my guide? Or this, with numberless blessings each moment he crowns, and filled with his fullness divine, I sing my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for such a Redeemer as mine. If you find yourself in need this morning, don't look to science or psychology or philosophy, the government, to other human beings for hope. For vain is the help of man. It's through God we shall do value. Trust in the Lord and in the promises of His Word. For all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. To the glory of God the Father. Well, may the Lord add His blessing to what's been said this morning. 
As always, if you have a question or concern about what's been said about you, come. I'm happy to share it with you. You can leave this morning knowing in your heart that all is well between you and the Lord. Let's take your books in closing.